I'm anxious about a lot of things in the era of the algorithm, but I first want to say that I am a technology optimist. Uh, I mean, I kind of got to be, because I, I make this stuff, for better or worse, right? My studio, Big Medium, makes uh, some of the things that Tina was talking about, interfaces and experiences around artificial intelligence and machine learning increasingly, but also connected devices, apps, and so on. And so I'm really excited about some of the superpowers that these things give to us. I mean, I think, you know, all of you, all of us now have these supercomputers in our pockets or handbags. Uh, and I'm really excited still about the things that they can do. But I, I admit that sometimes I don't always feel so good when I use them. You might even say I, sometimes I feel a little anxious about my habits with them. Because we've all been this guy, right? <laughs> we've all been this guy. You know what he's doing, too? He's like... Yeah, this uh, whale watch is really sucks. We haven't seen anything, right? <laughs> Missing the things that are right in front of us, disconnected from the, the, the people we love, the places that we see. And so, you know, I think that for me, a lot of times when I'm on the phone, and maybe you feel the same, I feel like I'm not giving the respect or attention that the people around me, the people I love, deserve, or the places or experiences that I might be missing because I'm lost in my screen. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I feel guilty. And sometimes I also feel like I'm also constantly being watched or monitored. What's happening through that phone? Maybe you feel the same way. I think what's interesting right now is that we're, we're starting to see a whole new wave of systems through machine learning and artificial intelligence that are again changing the way that we think or perceive the world, but in slightly different ways. This was the question that we all got on our name tags today. And I think what it's sort of getting at is, what is this next wave of technology? What are the opportunities that it provides? And I think it's an optimistic way to look at it. I think this is what, the way that I'm going to sort of try to frame the anxiety question is, instead of saying, what is it that we're afraid of? What is it that's going sideways already? It's more, what are the things, how can we take those fears and kind of turn that frown upside down, right, into some design principles that we can use to, to make sure that things maybe go a, a better way? So I want to share what my answer was to this question. Or maybe, maybe more appropriately, Alexa, treat me with respect, <laughs> right? Because it's not just the way that we interact with other people or don't, as with phones. Increasingly, it's now how do we interact with these systems? You know, we're talking to Alexa and to Google all the time, right? These voice-enabled, sort of smart assistants are clearly like a, a new and important part of interface design, of interaction design, of, a, of the sort of the, the digital creative world that we have. Uh, and so it seems like these are going to be kind of a big thing, right? Jack Donaghy certainly thinks so. Yeah, just accept <laughs> and this is kind of the way that new technologies work, right? They sort of work. We can see the opportunity in them. They're exciting. And yet they they also kind of let us down. I mean, this is sort of the way all technologies work throughout time. It's, you know, they mostly work, but they trip up on these sort of mundane realities of the everyday. Uh, they, they run into other systems, in this case, a TV inadvertently talking to a whole other system. Uh, so, you know, look, machines make mistakes. Mistakes will happen. People make mistakes. And so one of the things that I think is, is kind of interesting here is how do we as creative people start to help design to anticipate those mistakes in different ways so that we can sort of relieve people's anxieties or sort of uh, uh, allay them a little bit uh, when mistakes do happen. Because the thing is, right, is, is that even when the voice recognition works, as we've all experienced, the machines don't understand what to do with those words. Right? That there's nuance and subtlety that's lost, that, that creative professionals can help to couch and cushion that experience. But let me give you an example of the, the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Is that, you know, what's the intention, or often what's the context? Who is speaking, and does that make a difference? The device isn't aware that it's a child versus a parent. Which is exactly what happened today during our morning show when Jim and Linda were talking about a child who accidentally bought a dollhouse and four pounds of cookies. I love the little girls take on it. Alexa ordered me a dollhouse. As soon as Jim said that, viewers all over San Diego started complaining their Echo devices had tried to order dollhouses. 
every kid wants the four pound cookie machine, I think, is clearly the, the thing here. But you know, this is exactly, this is a Jack Donaghy problem, right? Who's speaking and does it matter? Uh, we saw this actually also in South Park. The, the season premiere this year back in September had an episode where all the kids were like talking to Siri and Alexa and uh, uh, Google Home with kind of typically kind of pout potty mouthed antics. Alexa, Simon says I gotta take a stinky poop. I gotta take a stinky poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hilarious. <coughs> The joke, though, is on the audience, because if you had one of these devices at home, your devices followed their lead, right? So what happened was, you know, your Alexa started to turn kind of potty-mouthed, and odd things started to show up in your shopping list. Right? <laughs> Who's speaking and what's the intention? This is, in some ways, right, this is a, a data science problem, an algorithm problem. That's for the... The, the nerds to figure out, right? Except that it's also really much more a, a, a sort of a design and presentation issue, too. You know, so... <laughs> how can we help to establish that there's some nuance here? You know, as the vision... There's a lot of these out there, you guys, and I want to prepare you for sort of a difficult one. All right. I know this is difficult to look at, but we all have to take this sacrifice. Image recognition is hard work, you guys. If the was this year, I'd vote for the chicken. <laughs> all right, there you go. <clears throat> uh, tough meat in either way, right? So, it's, uh, so image recognition is tough work, and nobody knows this better than Pick Deskbot, which is this Twitter robot that basically just finds random images through, uh, from, from the interwebs and sends them up to Microsoft's uh, image recognition service, and then just prints, just shows the description that it gets back, right? So that, that's it, sort of a simple idea. And usually, you know, it's pretty good. This is sort of a complex image that it's figuring out pretty well. It's kind of cute when it gets things wrong, <laughs> right? It's sort of, a, and it, it, it's sort of like I say, this almost kind of charming naivete <laughs> of, you know, you sort of see what it's thinking, but you can kind of see what's, what's going wrong there, too. I will say that I'm not going to ask the robots to do my Christmas shopping this year, I think, because it's sort of like, it's a little bit dubious. Look, kids, white teddy bears for everyone. The machines are weird, and they sort of logic differently than we do. And so what I've found, the more that I work with and, and design these machine learning experiences, is that it's less about designing for a fixed path through information and much more about just sort of trying to put some guardrails up around all the weird stuff that the people will ask these smart systems and that the smart systems will respond with. You know, so really what, I, what I've found is that for, for my work, just sort of designing experiences around this, it's really about setting appropriate expectations for what the system can do and channeling behavior in the right way. Which, when you think of these voice assistants, that's a real problem, right? Because there's no kind of cues about what they can do. They offer very little guidance. So you sort of have to guess and find your way. So we need to sort of start to do better than that so that we don't have these frustrating experiences with them. A lot of times we think about uh, machine learning, algorithms, as being the work of data scientists, of engineers. And that's certainly true. And in fact, they have done amazing work to kind of show what's possible, how good and accurate these systems really can be. And it, it is amazing. There's some real magic here. But I would also say that there's an important role for design in all of this, for the presentation of this information. And I want to talk about that and in some ways that, in context, I think are truly anxiety provoking in terms of some of the things that we've started to see and how design might start to help to correct some of those problems. Like I said, I'm going to sort of try to look at this less in terms of the fears that I have and more about the, the principles that I think that we can all follow, both as users of these systems as well as designers of them, to try to make a difference uh, and so that those fears and anxieties don't come to pass or at least are softened. And the first is about embracing uncertainty. All of these, there's sort of all the, the, the systems that use algorithms, there's a, a general kind of fetish for getting to the correct answer, the definitive answer, as quickly as possible. Uh, 
sort of the, there's this notion, this cult of the one true answer, which is great when it works, but it can have some really damaging results that go beyond misidentifying uh, a surfing dinosaur, right? So I want to talk a little bit about Google's featured snippets. Featured snippets are these things, right? You know, the, the box of, of content that shows up above the search results. And what it's doing is Google is saying, you know what, I've found not only the page that best matches your query, but the sentence or two, right? This is like, I feel lucky on steroids, right? It's like it's showing you, I've got it, I figured it out. And this is great when it works, right? For very simple information like this, we've all experienced this, this is great, but that's my answer, terrific, I'm done. But you've probably also found different places where it's latched on to content that doesn't quite feel exactly right. You know, so about a year ago, if you asked Google if fire trucks were red, you would get this helpful explanation. It's because they have eight wheels and four people on them, and four plus eight makes 12, and they're 12 inches in a foot, and one foot is a ruler, and Queen Elizabeth was a ruler. It's like a kid's nonsense thing, right? And for whatever reason, the algorithm was like, this is it. I'm going to give you the answer, right? Kind of silly, but it, things can also get a little bit more serious. So when Obama was president, if you asked, is Obama planning martial law? The answer was yes. Here's the evidence of it, right? Or more recently, if you would start typing in, did Trump, it would complete your question, did Trump commit treason? And simultaneously, as it completed the question, give you the answer, yes, definitely committed treason. So here's an interesting case where, right, where the algorithm is not only answering your question, but giving you the question to ask and then delivering sort of a plainly controversial answer. Google fixed this problem about 18 months ago, but if you, at, if you started to type in, are Jews, it would answer, yeah, right, get ready. It would suggest, are Jews evil, as one of the suggestions. And then if you chose it, all the search results were pages that suggested that, yes, indeed, they are evil. One of the tricky things, too, is around Google Home, the Google's assistant, will use these featured snippets as answers when they're available. And they're available for about 15% of searches, so it's not all of them. But it, when Google has a featured snippet, it will provide that snippet as the answer. And then so until <clears throat> January or February uh, last year, when Google took action to fix this, if you asked, brace yourself, OK, Google, are women evil? The answer was yes, followed by a 30-second explanation of exactly why. <laughs> right? Again, this part of this is an algorithm problem, plucking out a bad answer, or sort of a, especially in these sort of hostile information zones that are gamed by hate speech or propaganda. So there's, a, there's an algorithm problem here. But I would also suggest there's a really important design problem which is that the presentation of the answer suggests a confidence that does not actually exist. Right? That this rush, this idea of sort of being like, let's show the results of the algorithm as quickly as possible, suggests again this kind of confidence, this one true answer that isn't there. It's this false confidence. What we need to do, it's sort of another way to put it, it's an article that I, I wrote recently, is to build systems that are smart enough to know that they're not smart enough. Put another way. Our job now is to think about how can we give some productive humility to these systems so that they are honest about what they know and what they don't know, but also can kind of go into this idea of to saying, I'm not sure, or I think this is the answer, instead of this is the answer. Again, that is a design and presentation problem. Let's go back to our friend Pick Despot, which is sort of saying, I got it, dinosaur on top of a surfboard, right? But when you look at the what the, the API, what the results, the data actually reveals, if you dig into it, you see this 0.257 number, that means that it's actually only got 26% confidence that it's a di dinosaur on top of a surfboard. But it's got 97% confidence that it's a dinosaur. So how might we just think about changing the way that we talk about this information? Maybe some language changes, right? It's a dinosaur, eh, maybe on top of a surfboard, 26% certain. We could start to show also, you know, sort of where that certainty is and where it's not. This is sort of a rough idea, rough concept. But the idea here is just like, well, let's, let's just be clear about what we're confident about and what we're not. And sort of develop a body language in the same way that we do with people to kind of say, eh, you know, what's the new body language for designing for machines? How do we express uncertainty and confidence? 
So honest interfaces and productive humility. I was talking with some of the designers from the Facebook newsfeed team who are obviously trying to contend with this. How do we separate misinformation and propaganda or, or give people more options? They're definitely intrigued by this idea of like, how can we start to create this idea of humility, of sort of showing where there's confidence or where there's alternative information. They've been working through a, a whole lot of different ways to, to show that information as a hedge against all of the misinformation that's been shared and the way that people have been gamed through their newsfeed. Part of this, though, is that we do need to improve the data. And I would say that, again, this is something that we've often sort of said, oh, the data scientists will figure that out. They're experts at marshalling data. But I would also say that the machines, but it, let me say why this is important. The machines obviously can create decisions based on only on the information that we give them. They extract patterns from, from the information available and give their conclusions based on that. And so, just as an example, sometimes the results are a little bit not what you would quite, what you'd expect. This is the way that machines understand human romance. This is what happens, these are the results of uh, machine-generated pickup lines <laughs> based on a few thousand pickup <laughs> lines that were given to this, right? And they're kind of funny, right? It's like, you must be a Tringle. It's like, what is it even talking about? But there's some sweetness here too, right? This last one, you look like a thing. <laughs> and I love you. I don't care what kind of thing you are. You're my thing. Right? But the point here, right, is that there is no such, no, really no such thing as a good pickup line, right? So if you give it a bunch of bad pickup lines, of which there only are those, you're going to get bad pickup lines out, right? I think the important thing to understand about machine learning is that the whole, what they're great at is figuring out what's normal and then predicting the next normal thing, I recommend that you do this, or to call out outliers. This looks like an illness or an imminent crime or you know, problems, right? Which is great, they're great at that, of just essentially taking, here's a bunch of data and understanding what's normal in that data and what's not. The question is, what if normal is garbage? What if we're giving it data that, doesn't, that has inherent bias in it. And frankly, our world has inherent bias in it, right? As we sort of start to give these systems all of the, the data based on, the, on our own imperfect world, we also give it our own ugly truths, you know? So some, sometimes these things feel a little bit more like, like you feel them more than you see them. There was a study just over a year ago from Google that found a, a gender bias in the way that it understands speech. And so basically, if you gave it uh, a random male and random female voice, 70% of the time it would understand the male voice better. Even though women tend to speak slower, have longer vowels, have better enunciation, sort of ideal characteristics in general for voice recognition, the man was understood better. Right? So it has this effect where it's sort of like you don't understand the thing, but it feels this way, right? And what a metaphor for the technology industry, right? Where it's sort of saying, we're treating women as outliers instead of as half the population, or put in a more crass economic way, accounting for three quarters of domestic spending, right? An important commercial group if that is, in fact, important for this business. But the, the, the thing that's, that, that's here with this, right, is that it feels like you don't exist when you're not understood by these systems. I, I, I wrote a haiku about it, you guys. You know, so you know that feeling, right, where you're just like, the system can't see me, the system can't see me. And then sometimes you realize it's got a handle. You know, it's like a, you're sort of like living in the future too much. I am a white, straight, middle-class, middle-aged American man, and stuff generally cuts my way more than I, frankly, have deserved or have earned. Uh, the faucets usually work for me. <laughs> I wrote this haiku before I saw this video that I'm going to show you. Let's see how well the faucets work for other folks. All right, so watch this. Black hand, nothing. Larry? Go. Black hand, <laughs> nothing. Larry, go. <laughs> Racist mother six. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'd like to introduce you to Richard Lee. Richard is a New Zealand citizen, and this is what he saw when he applied to renew his passport online. Yeah, seriously, what the hell? You know, what is going on here? What the actual hell is going on here? It's like you didn't bother to test this faucet, this particular sensor with black hands. You didn't bother to think about this enormous population of, of Asian New Zealanders as you sort of created this algorithm? Does, would, did you perhaps test it on people who looked like the people who designed the thing? No. So the, the thing is, it's like, what is the data that we're giving? How much are we putting into it? And the risk is that we'll codify the past. And this is a wonderful line from Kathy O'Neill in her book, Weapons of Math Destruction. And what it's talking about is, if we're taking all of the past data to predict the future, doesn't that mean that we're going to have all the problems of the past? That you know, we, we already have systems now that are handling prison sentencing uh, recommendations. And it's like you put in all the systems, they're incredibly biased against black men. Predicting recidivism, you know, repeat offenders, incredibly biased against black men for the past there. If you're thinking about this for promotion or hiring, this is not going to help women or people of color in terms of who should, should show up uh, as the next executive if we're not careful about the way that we frame that data. Right? So how do we avoid building our ugly past into the future. And maybe put another way, how do we think about gathering data that reflects the future we want to build? Which includes value decisions, right? I think that our current political situation shows that reasonable people can disagree on what a fair future looks like. Uh, so this is a tricky question, but I would sort of say that sort of settling for the past isn't the answer either. So the, kind of the third thing, the sort of third design principle is here, how do we gather data responsibly? And the way that I would put, put this is this is design research, UX research at unprecedented scale. And what I'm talking about is as we research and gather the data for these systems, and I'm talking about huge scale, right? you need millions and millions of data points to train a really good algorithm. We've got to do all the things that any great design team would do, right? Figure out who this is for, figuring out who it's informed by, and really sort of doing some deep learning around who those people are. Only now we're doing it at a scale that we've never had to deal with before. But I'm saying that this is a design question, a human question, and not just an engineering question. We have to sort of get people on our teams who reflect the broader community. And I'm not talking just about gender or ethnic or religious diversity. Genevieve Bell, an anthropologist, wonderful, incredibly brilliant person, recently of Intel, sort of suggests we need to get all these other fields involved. If this is sort of the, the, the systems that are going to be shaping all these kind of questions and answers that are central to our civic society, prison sentencing, policing, uh, financial decisions, hiring and promotion, healthcare, then we've got to sort of have everybody who are touched by these things involved. Everyone needs to inform here. I mentioned before that the machines only know what we feed them. So what I was talking about here just a moment ago was who is going to do the research? And I want to sort of pivot a little bit into how are we going to do the research? Because it's important to remember not just, you know, we, not just this fact, but what it is that we're feeding them. We are feeding them us, right? Our intimate details, the stuff that we volunteer, that we give up voluntarily through our everyday usage of these digital systems and things where we're being observed where we don't even necessarily know it. This old saw, right, that if, if, uh, if it's free, you're not the customer, you're the product, is quickly becoming this, right, where you are the training data. You are, by using the system, you are giving up information to some purpose that you may not be completely aware of. Quick question, I don't know, maybe you, you guys sometimes have dashed sort of a not particularly well-considered note into Facebook before maybe changing your mind and putting something a little milder, <laughs> right? <laughs> Facebook, even though you haven't submitted that, already has that first submission. They take it and add it to your sort of profile. They have a complete psychographic profile of things you haven't even realized that you've said out loud. 
right? They sort of keep that and that sort of goes into, it's like, yep, Josh is an angry person. <laughs> right? So the point here, right, is that we're in this situation that I think has to change, that we need to again come up with this idea of honest interfaces, transparent interfaces. What is this? When is my data being used and how? Lo things that are going into law in the EU this year that have to be observed and that probably have no shot in hell of going into law here in the US, which means that the people who build these systems have to be responsible enough to take care to be like, you know what? Let's start to give people control over their data. Let's start to give some transparency around this stuff. Because somewhere along the line, we went from, as a community asking, is it good for users, to asking, how can we just sort of dig as much money out of their data as possible? Right? I'm not sure that that's the future that we want to have. So I guess I would say, you guys, anybody who is touching these systems, designing these systems, please be loyal to the user. And as a user, demand loyalty from the companies who do this. Let them know that you aren't happy that are doing things that you don't want to do. And by loyal to the user, I mean really loyal to the user. Designers talk a lot about user-centric design, but you know, we also have to answer to the man. You know, design is a commercial activity and it has to benefit its patron. But as we do that, how can we still sort of find that narrow path that connects business goals and business interests with user goals and user interests in a way that is respectful and honest and true? This is another way to put this, you guys. It's be kind to each other. And I mean this in a way that is really intentional and thoughtful and not just merely polite. But how, do we, how can we deeply be kind to one another and care about the experiences for people who don't look like us? who live a different life from us? And how do we start to think about that in a sort of very deep data sense before it sort of gets away from all of us? The future should not be self-driving. And I think that the best way that we can sort of put these fears and anxieties aside is to take the driver's seat. They can sort of be intentional about this, be kind to one another, and think about some of these values that I've had a chance to share in just these few sort of 20 minutes. If you are interested in learning more about this, here's sort of three resources that I'd encourage you to go to. My astonishing wife, Liza Kindred, has started a project called Mindful Technology about creating technologies and products that, are, that promote attention rather than steal it, sort of a, lead a more human life. The UVET agenda is the outcome of a retreat that I was in in October, thinking of with where a, a bunch of creative professions came together to think about what would we like, the, the, what are the questions really that need to be answered to make sure that this machine learning, artificial intelligence future rolls out in the right way. And then at my own site, Big Medium, there's a lot of writing and talks about this subject if you're interested in it. The last thing that I would like to say to you guys is that you are a thing and I love you, yeah. you bunch of champions. Thank you. Thank you so much.